Hey guys, I just wanted to say uh, before we get to the podcast today that our sponsor this month is uh, returning, uh, Figurosity.com. If uh, you're into drawing and you need some uh, models to work from, these are 3D generated computer models of different uh, genders and sizes of people. You can turn them, you can change the lighting, and uh, it's a great website with lots of options. So if you go to figure, Figurosity.com, you can sign up, and using the coupon code ANATOMY101, you get $5 off, which equals to about uh, a free month. And uh, it's a great artist tool and great way to practice. Uh, you can even kind of set up a series of drawings, so uh, so kind of a timed drawing type thing. And it's very similar to our uh, figure drawing groups. That's why they like to sponsor us, and we love to have them as spo- uh, sponsors again and again. So thank you again to Figurosity.com, and that is coupon code anatomy 101 so now let's get into the podcast it's like if jk rowling was writing harry potter and had no control over what the characters (laughs) were doing so you'd be like harry you're a wizard you'd be like nah i don't feel like going Welcome back, Inebriites. This is Andy, the Inebriite Podcast. Uh, we are recording today at the Dirty Water Distillery in Plymouth. Um, you know, everyone just loves to invite us, and there's usually liquor, so we show up. And uh, our guest today is Richard Kelly, uh, who is a game designer, which is really funny. We've kind of wanted a game designer around for a while, but we didn't know any. And then was it uh, someone reached out to us from one of our events? Uh, in her relation to you is I can't remember. Uh, my uncle. It was probably okay, my so, uncle, okay. Paul, yep. who would have reached out to you. Um, so they, they came and they started telling us uh, about you, and they're like, oh, he's a game designer, but it's like a role-playing game, and we were all like, we love role-playing games. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, uh, you know, any chance to nerd out. So uh, we set this up pretty quickly. That I think that was Monday? Last Monday. That sounds about yeah. right. In in Kickstarter time, it all kind of blurs. So, uh, my understanding was you were working doing some game design for someone, and then you're like, I can do this on my own. Is that relatively how that happened? Uh, it's it's not quite like I was I was in an environment that I broke free of. Mm-hmm. It's more that I'm sort of doing everything at once. Yeah. Anytime I find I've got like more than a couple minutes spare, I start putting them towards a project. So I, I freelance. Yeah. Uh, there's a handful of companies I've worked with. They're super cool. I like the people I work with there. Um, but I've also got some of my own projects on yeah. sort of the side burner. Um, so for our listeners that don't know what an RPG yes. is, it's Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. That's, that's, you know, the shorthand. Um, but even that I find, because well, I'm a huge Dungeons and Dragons nerd, <laughs> So I'll be talking to someone. I'll be like, oh, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons. They'll be like, ooh, did you win? And you just will be like, I don't even know where to begin. I <laughs> get that from my fiance every time I do any time of a so game how play do you, test. how do you explain a role-playing game to someone who's not familiar? Uh, there's like three different ways I'd go about it depending on what their background is. So you've... You've told me that you've played D and D. Oh yeah, you've yeah. got a sense of oh yeah I've, of yeah, what it I is. I played D and D back in the day. I played Rifts. Nice. Um, so I I, I I am familiar. But I found that people tend to come from either a computer game, a board game, or a fiction background. Yep. Either you've read novels and you've at least encountered the concept of this would be different if this character made a different decision. What would it be like to follow that different decision? The way I tend to describe it is be like, well, it's like if J.K. Rowling was writing Harry Potter and had no control over what the characters <laughs> were doing. So you'd be like, Harry, you're a wizard. And you'd be like, nah, I don't feel like going. That's, <laughs> that's another good way of describing it. I, I think storytelling that the audience participates in yeah. is a good way of framing it. 
or a board game that's very invested in the story as mm -hmm. much as the dice rolls and the figures and the rules is another good way of describing it or a video game where you're not limited to just the things the designers Ugh. mapped out for you. You can it, sort of head in any direction. drives me crazier than someone being like, oh, I played an RPG on a video game. I'm like, it's not an RPG. <laughs> you can't do crazy shit. Uh, you are limited to what you can do. I... I mean, I get it in video games terms, that's what it's <laughs> called, but it, it lacks that sandbox world feel, like where you can... I mean, they're getting more that way. With, with like, you know, uh, Red Dead Redemption, things like yeah. that, where you can really kind of go off and do whatever you want. But when you vary from the storyline, you kind of lose that interaction, where in yep. a role-playing game, you can vary off the storyline, but you're still going to interact with people, and it's still going to be a story. I Honestly, I think there's a lot of, like, interstitial space in between these concepts. Like, yeah. there's space in between a board game and a video game. There's space in between a video game and, a, like, a tabletop game, a tabletop RPG, rather. Um, and, like, sometimes they kind of blur together. You can get board games that are very story-focused. Yeah. That are, that are about acting and participating and telling a story. Kind of like as, uh, Mice and Mystics is that way. Ah, uh, I I don't know that one. It's very RPG heavy. Um, it's basically like a D and D module that comes with maps and figures all set out for it. So, what is it about RPGs that made you want to? So, for our listeners, there's two types of people that play role playing games: <laughs> the people who run the game, which in Dungeon Dragons terms is a dungeon master, also called a game master, and then there's the players. To take it up to the next level of being like, I want to write this. Because, like, a, a dungeon master, game master is very much in charge of the, the story. They kind of can write their own story. But this is a different... You're writing your own system. Like, what made you make that leap? Uh, I don't know that it's that much of a leap. I think the lines between those three things, designer and dungeon master and player, are already kind of blurry. Okay. Because when... As a player, if, if you're playing a tabletop role-playing game, you're contributing to the story. Sure. And sometimes the things that you're introducing to the fiction, the dungeon master's riffing off of. Yeah. And building, like, plot elements and storylines behind it. And then, like, while the dungeon master's doing that, they might be thinking, all right, I've got sort of my own setting here. What if I just put different dice mechanics in it and change it so that it plays exactly the way I want it to play? And by that point, they've turned into a game designer. Yeah. It's it, and that's very true, because like, even like um, in the DM, Dungeon Master's Guide, um, sorry, D&D &D Dungeon Master's Guide, it's like, these rules are suggestions. You yeah. can tweak them. There's home rules. Like, I like to, um, like, it, I don't like to take rolls away from the players, because people show up because they want to roll dice. But I like to take away the stealth roll. Okay. Because there's too many times where someone's like, Oh, I'm, I'm gonna stealth into a room, and they roll, and they're like, "Oh, it's a two. Never mind." And you're like, "No, that's not how it works. Yep. You don't know you're not stealthy till you're not stealthy." Yep, yep. And I guess it sort of depends on how familiar the listeners are with again, role playing, tabletop role playing. There will be a lot of different like game mastering philosophies yeah. at play and design philosophies, um, but that control over what kind of information is out in the open mm -hmm. and what kind of information is hidden can do a lot to shape a game. Yeah. Even if you change nothing else, just taking a bit of information and secluding it from the players yeah, yeah. or revealing it because, is, is a very Because it goes experience. from, oh, I know I'm not stealthy, to, okay, so you sneak, air quotes, into the room, and they're like, well, how'd I do? Be like, you'll find out. Yep, <laughs> yep. It builds tension in my mind. I did sort of an yeah. early experiment as a, a game master yeah. where I rolled everything on my side and didn't let the players see anything. Yeah. Um, it's not what I would necessarily recommend, but it absolutely changes the tone. If um, to, to sort of shift it into a different media, if you're playing a video game and you have no idea what your character's stats are. You right. can't see the health bar, you can't see your ammunition counter, anything like that. Yeah. You feel a little bit more tense. You feel a little bit less secure oh, in what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, because you don't, you just don't know. And and like, so stealth always bothered me and the kind of the, the 
investigation. You know, oh, I searched yeah. the room, and they wrote ter- terribly. So the next person's like, well, I searched the room, too. I've been like, oh, are we going to roll through everybody <laughs> until you roll well? Is that what's going to happen? There, and, there is a kind of secondary problem there, which is if you're creating a scenario that you want the players to play through, and you have a piece of information that they're supposed to find, that but is, there's a chance they don't find it, your story can just stall right there. And I... I think a lot of game designers have gotten much better about this yeah. in the past 20 years or so. And that can even be a DM thing. Like, I, I've briefly mentioned something, and the, you know, the tonality in your voice is slightly different, or you use a word that suddenly they like latch onto, and they're like, oh, we clearly have to investigate this tower. And you're like, in your head, you're like, no, no, no you don't. <laughs> Please don't go to the tower. <laughs> yeah. So now they're breaking into a tower, and you're like, okay, uh, I, let me make something up on the fly of what's in the tower. Yeah. But it, to me, that's kind of part of the fun of being the DM. Yeah, and it's it's a hobby that involves both creative improv and storytelling and following rules. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. those three things will come into conflict. Oh, sure. Sometimes yeah. you'll have a rule that makes the game less fun. Yeah. And then it's the group's call on whether to just toss the rule out or to stick with the book as written in hopes that the book's designer knew what they were doing better than the group does. and Right, because sometimes if you toss guaranteed. it out, it can break the game in ways you don't foresee. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think there's any one good approach, just speaking personally. Um, it's as kind of niche as it is, it's a big field with a ton of philosophies, and I think they're all cool. The, to me, the most important thing is getting a like-minded group together. Yes. Because that way you can be like, hey, let's throw this rule out. Oh, no, no, let's put that rule back in. And, you yep. know, it, that that's playing with good friends is the most important thing. Yeah, that helps. I think the core is kind of communication. Yeah. If you have a group, even if they have very different philosophies, but everyone can communicate really well, mm-hmm. it might not be the same game from second to second. Yeah. But the group will be happy and no one will be like really at odds with each other. Right. Because everyone's communicating well. And I, I think as as a designer, there's sort of a responsibility to try and teach that, too. I, uh, I remember th- this is the perfect instance. Because um, I like to do... Everybody wants to be the hero. No one plays to be, like, the sidekick. So I like to kind of, like, give my players um, abilities kind of as their character grows. And... Um, I was playing with my friend Kristen, and her uh, character was uh, Abby Cadaver, nice. and she was a rogue, Nice. and was obsessed with stealing and looting everything. So I gave her, um, I, I kind of, on the fly, I made a uh, rule, and it, I called it the death tax. If she scored the killing uh, blow on a character... She could make a roll, and I think on like a 18, 19, and 20, she got to loot something off the corpse before it hit the ground. Oh, neat. Okay. So I thought it was cool. It was a lot of fun. She'd really enjoy it. And then she shot something with a crossbow from a uh, crossbow from across the room. She's like, now I get to roll, right? I'm like, <laughs> no, you're across the room. She's like, that's not what it says. I'm like, come on. This is. And so then you kind of have to be like, all right, from now on. So, so it's this little kind of like. So you've done design as well. Kind of, yeah. That's, I mean, that's Within, what I'm talking about, right. with the lines being a little bit blurry. It, as as you play, and the game starts to feel like it's in almost the right state, Yeah. but not quite, you make patches on your own and change mechanics sure, and yeah. introduce elements, and it makes a much more custom experience. Mm-hmm. So we've been talking about the experience in general, but you are working on a game system. Oh, um, sure, yeah. So tell us a little bit about what it is. What's it called? You know, is it a D20 system? Is it a D6 system? Yep. Uh, so I've, I've worked on a couple of game systems. Mm-hmm. Um, right now there's two that are really my system. Uh, and there's a handful of systems for other studios. Uh, shout out to Void Spiral Entertainment. Shout out to the Polyhedral Knights. Um, shout out to End Transmission. Uh, normally I, shout outs on this team. Uh, on this team on this podcast or when someone says something horrible about someone they're like hey shout out to Steve oh no <laughs> oh uh, this is the good version of the shout out uh, I will observe that podcast yeah. etiquette going forward but the the games that I've written sort of for myself um, I have The Dawn Line mm-hmm. which is a again not not knowing the audience not knowing how familiar everyone is I'm just going to rattle off some facts and sure then, sure 
give yeah, context. If there's anything to them. that I think needs context, I'll ask questions. So, uh, so it's a D6 system. So it's um, a, a, a normal six-sided die. Yep, yep, and it is about a. It's about the setting as much as it's about the characters, and the setting is a world that rotates very, very slowly. Okay. So the day and the night are both places. Oh. Um, and because it rotates very, very slowly, weather is weird, climate is weird, and neither the daylight nor the night is inhabitable by people. It's so where do the people terribly live? Terribly cold in the night. <laughs> it is burning hot in the day. People live in the dusk and the dawn, which are rotating bands that slowly circle oh, the planet. Okay. The game itself is a gothic science fantasy about vampires. Okay. And the human communities that they protect. Okay. Um, so it is a very community-focused game. It's got mechanics around the village that you're defending and what the oh, people are like cool. and what resources they have. Yeah. And it's got mechanics around the vampires, the player characters themselves, um, whenever they sort of go out to... Pr- preemptively protect the village from a threat yeah, uh, or to find resources and bring them home or to scout for new villagers. And that game has a flow where you move from the village to the adventure and back to the village. So you're always leaving and returning to the community. Yeah. Um, and I, I like that community feeling in games. So I built something a little bit similar for my second game um, my second game is a fishing adventure RPG. That's the one I saw, and I was like, <laughs> this is unique. It's, I think, the only game of its kind. There yep. are certainly other vampire games. There are definitely other science fantasy. Yep. There are other post-apocalyptic, migration-based, I've never weird heard of a fishing RPGs. Game. Yeah. The fishing game might be new, but I don't want to say definitively because... The design You're here to hear first. The only fishing game <laughs> RPG game available. There's probably someone else who's written one, and I feel super bad if I beat them slightly to the punch. <laughs> um, uh, so I made Rod Reel and Fist, okay. which is a fishing adventure game about a group of fishers who are trying to catch a magical fish and save their village from peril. Is this also a D6? It is a D6, but it's a quite different system. Okay. Um, it's designed to be very simple and light. Uh, in Is this what they would refer to as like a, a, a one-pager, where the rules are kind of like encompassed in like Not l- very, very quite. brief? Yeah. Uh, it definitely started as kind of a micro game, yep. where the goal is to make it as, as lightweight and compact and easy to play as possible. Uh, you minimize the rules. You minimize the story. You just keep everything on a single page if you can. Or Which maybe... I think is is it's a great way to write a game um, because it allows you know to to learn a new system it can be yep. time consuming. And then you're kind of like, well, we got to play it to see if we like it, yep. which can be more time consuming. Like a one page, you can play a couple times and be like, oh, it's not my thing. Oh, I really like this. Yeah, I, I think one-page games or micro games are a great design exercise. You yeah. learn how to build everything lightweight, and then you can expand from there. This one started a little bit heavier than a lightweight game, but it's got that core philosophy where it's supposed to be easy to get into. So why fishing? Are you uh, a fisher? Fisher, fisherman? I am certainly not a good fisher. I've had <laughs> a few a formative experiences with fishing, yeah. all of which were interesting, but I, I'm definitely not an accomplished angler. No. Uh, instead, as a kid, I'd played a Game Boy game yep. um, called Legend of the River King. Okay. Which is a fishing adventure game where you are similarly trying to catch a, a mystical fish to prevent a tragedy from occurring. And along the way, you move from fishing spot to fishing spot, catching fish, trading them for supplies. And kind of moving up. Fighting to, yeah. wild animals. And... I'd never seen that game done anywhere else, and that that sort of imp of what if I could yeah. formed the core of this game, to see if I could write a fishing RPG that would be compelling and interesting and fun. And what's been the feedback on it? Like To me, that's a curious thing. I, I mean, I've seen games been like, oh, well, I don't know if that's <laughs> really my things, but you know, once people play it, I mean, that's... Like, yep. what, what's been the feedback? Are people like, oh, it, it's so it's such a unique uh, 
perspective to start with? Part of the design process, or at least part of my design process, is to get as much feedback as possible. Mm -hmm. When I'm doing a rough draft, I kind of just bash things together based on what I think might be interesting, what I think might fit with the concept. Yep. And then I take it to my groups of playtesters and run the game for them and see what they think. Is it fun? Does it work? Are there places where the rules are completely confusing? Yeah. Is, is there stuff that's just not in the book? that I put a note saying, write this, and then never did. Right, 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 um, yeah. And from their feedback, I get something that resembles a much more, like, a much more normal rough draft. The yeah. original draft is very, very basic. But once I've heard back from the people who've played the game, and I know which direction to take it, then I start to tweak sort of all the, the mechanics and the setting elements and move it in a different direction. It, it, it's... To me, it's it's fascinating because it's kind of like being a novelist in a way, but having to develop rules on how your characters progress through the story. Yes, that's that's definitely part of it. Um, for me, I found it's a little bit more like writing code. Yeah. But the variables are much less controllable. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's DM'd a game knows that uh, your story plan usually goes out the window, I don't know, 20 minutes into a game. Yep. And yep. anyone who's played, any plan you have never lasts uh, through first contact with the enemy. Yes. I assume probably a lot of the audience will have seen Stranger Things. Yep. Stranger it, Things is a very good example of what D&D looks like and plays like. Mm -hmm. And it's also a good showcase of the moments where, like, the players aren't really feeling it and are just goofing around. Yeah. And then the person running the game is left with this task of, how do I reinterest them? Do I just try to force them into the story? No, that didn't work. What do they actually care about in this moment? Right. And that's kind of... that. that I think that's the trick when you're running a game is to... You know, if you if you're hosting a bunch of murder hobos that just want to kill things, sure, sure, then that's what you got to set up. If you have people who are serious, want to do like real role playing, then that's kind of how you got to lean. And that that's that playing with friends who are of like mind because yep. not everyone's going to play the same game the same way. Yeah. And it can ruin a game for everybody if someone's really upset and been like, I just want to kill things. I don't want to sit here for <laughs> 20 minutes and talk to the the clerk at the store. Yep. Yep. I, and D and D, because it's sort of it's most people's introduction to tabletop role playing. Mm -hmm. D and D covers such a broad range of yeah. types of games. You can do a murder mystery with D and D. Sure. You can do a dungeon crawl. You can do high fantasy politics. You can do low fantasy mud and blood like R R Martin style storytelling. Yep. And those are all very different feelings that would interest very different groups. Do you feel there is a significant increase in the popularity of role-playing with the dawn of things like Twitch and um, podcasts? I mean, I oh. myself, I'm a huge Critical Role fan. Yep. Uh, I love Adventure Zone. Yep, yep. Um, and, Adventure, and they're to two totally different styles of play. Oh, yeah. The Adventure Zone is very silly. Like, they have elevators and quote-unquote cars. And yep. It's just fun, and Critical Role is so dramatic and, and so story-driven. Yeah. Um, do, do you feel that those things have, have brought new people into the, the hobby? I think so. I mean, I think the hobby is kind of growing overall, and I think it's getting more exposure basically everywhere. Yeah. Uh, podcasting has definitely helped. Um, I listen to stuff like Film Reroll which um, they use GURPS to play through movies. Oh, okay. Uh, and they're all working actors. Yeah. And so they, like, they bring a ton of energy and panache, if I'm pronouncing that word right, sure. I might not be, to the craft. And it, it interests people who've never before really been exposed to tabletop role playing. Yeah. And by the same token, stuff like Stranger Things. Uh, Stranger Things, uh, Big Bang, it's been on. And yep. even on Big Bang, I'm like, okay, that's not exactly how it's played. That's pretty close, yeah, you know, yeah. for for the the lay person, you know that that's understandable. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like there's less explaining that I have to do to people. You know, it's when you're, you know, you go on a date with someone and you're like, oh well, 
what are you doing this week? I'm going to my buddy's house to play, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. And there's this kind of moment where they don't really know how to take it. Where yeah. they're like, is he a man child? Or is yeah. this a normal thing? The stigma is definitely decreasing. Yeah. As, as people do it without being embarrassed by it. And I think that's the big part of stuff like Critical Role. It's people playing a game and not being like ashamed of or embarrassed by the fact that they're using their imagination to tell a story. Just going with it. And to me, it's the reason for me to get together with my friends. Yeah. You know, it, it, you know I'm not a football fan. I don't give a <laughs> shit what happens on Sunday. So, you know, we'll get together and we'll play D&D instead. And it's the same kind of thing. Everyone brings some snacks. There's some beer. You know, when you were a kid, it was Mountain Dew and Doritos. And, sure, and sure. And now it's like craft beer and, you know, Char- spinach Char- artichoke. Board, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, um... So it's the same thing, but it, it's in in like so one of the stereotypical things that I always hear um, people be like, "Oh, is it you and a bunch of guys?" And be like, "No, our group is literally split down the middle: three guys, three girls." Yeah. And it's one of the most fun things that I do, you know, because everyone's relaxed. You know, people are, tend not to be on their phone, if, if provided they're not like cut out for some weird reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just it's usually silly. Yeah, I, it's a social game about having fun, and everyone's kind of riffing off of a story, but there's usually side conversations and in-jokes, and it's it's friends hanging out for the most part. Yeah, yeah, and um, we're, we're actually currently playing um, Dragon Heist. Oh, nice, yeah. And so, you know, everyone makes up their character, and so I, I made up a, a dwarf paladin, and I kind of wrote a brief backstory, and I, I sent it to the DM, and I'm like, um, he's a vengeance paladin, and he's seeking vengeance because Knowles stole his grandfather's war hammer that had his family's beer recipe engraved on it. <laughs> and turns out, like, three adventures into Dragon Heist, they give you a tavern. Oh, nice. So we derail almost every, like, session where it suddenly becomes like, wait, who's manning the bar? What do we have on special? Let's do this. <laughs> our, you know, what's our marketing like? <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, there is definitely a value to the side quest. Yep. And to whatever thing the players take an interest in, sort of becoming the core of the story. So how much when you're uh, making a game system, do you, when you make the game system, are, are you just setting up the world, or are you putting kind of like a module together for it as well? So kind of like a, a basic story, the, the, the general quest. That depends an awful lot on the system. Yeah. Um, I think you can start from almost any direction. You can start with a story or a setting idea and build everything else around that. I think White Wolf, yeah. uh, who does the World of Darkness product line, um, tends to favor that approach. They have a story, then they come up with mechanics that complement the story, and then they build modules off of that. Um, I think you can also start with the mechanics and say, I want the rules and the dice to incentivize the players to do this. Mm -hmm. And from there, you can build a story around that. Um, I think a lot of indie games take that approach. They'll be like, I want a story about fear, or I want a story about animosity, and then they'll build the dice to convey that kind of emotion through the game. And I think part of that is also like just trying to separate yourself from D&D. You don't want to be just a knockoff. So you're like, well, sure. I'm not going to be a D20 system, but that's a 20-sided die, <laughs> um, which D&D is. Almost everything you roll is based on a, a 20-sided die. Uh, so I feel like it's part of it's that kind of like distinction of like to separate yourself from them, to kind make it of? different. I... I don't think I've ever felt propelled by the desire to be different from another system. I, I think usually I'm going towards a design rather than away from someone else's okay. design. Yeah. Like, I, I really like D&D. I think it's... I don't think it's a perfect game, but I think it's a very stable game yeah. that's very good at customizing itself to the group. And so, like, I don't think I'd design a game to compete with them. I'm not sure I could... But I think if I, if I pick very different ideas and just head in that direction and not really worry about what D&D is doing, mm-hmm. I'll usually end up with something that feels different and plays different and is internally consistent 
Now, as you play test this, is there any point where you kind of like figure like, oh crap, it's broken in this way? Let's, yes. Let's hope no one notices that, no. or do you just try to then come up with a fix? Yes to that first part, no to that second part, because yeah. if I find a bug, not only is everyone else going to find that particular bug, they're going to find 10 more that I haven't noticed. Yeah. So, like, my process is to roughly build a game, run it by the playtesters, see what's broken, because stuff is always broken, and it's always stuff I never would have anticipated. And so once I've got that feedback, I can start patching and tweaking and slowly changing the game so that the core rules actually work. And to me, where you like, you know, um, in ways you never thought, to me that is the beauty of a role-playing game. Oh, yes. Because there, it, to me it's about getting abilities, items, and spells, and then getting into a situation and being like, okay, I have this item that does X, Y, or Z, completely not pertaining to what the situation I'm in yep. now, but how can I make it work? Yes. You know? I, because role-playing games are storytelling games, they tend to sort of structure themselves so that they've got a set of rules and mechanics, and then inside the game, next to those mechanics is a series of things that break those rules and mechanics. Yeah. In, in Dungeons and Dragons, it's spells, it's items, it's abilities that say, this rule that you've been following, you don't have to follow it exactly. You can do this other thing instead. Right. And when you have, Dungeons and Dragons is a great example. When you have more exceptions than rules, people can get very creative with how those exceptions work uh, and like stack exception off of exception to create unusual styles of gameplay and perhaps things the designers didn't intend, yep. but that are still fun and out of the box and creative. And, and sometimes that's like one of the best things is finding that kind of uh, kind of that that back door that um, so I was playing 3.5, third edition D&D yep. &D, and uh, the Dru Druid had a spell called Entangle and we knew that there was like goblins or something on the floor above us and they knew we were down there so it's kind of like all right do we rush in like what's the what are we gonna do and the druid's like well i'm gonna cast and tangle and dm's like well you can't see up there and he's like yeah but didn't you say there was a murder hole above when we walked in and he's like yeah he's like so i'm gonna look up the murder hole and cast and tangle through the murder hole because i can see through that you can just see the dm be like well shit <laughs> And it just became like one of those like very clever ways to kind of like work in our advantage, and that's to me that's the the, the brilliant, the fun part, the the video game role playing never can yes you know co you know copy because you can't think of every possibility. Yes, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, no, no like ill will towards video game role playing. I I personally like. Uh, video game RPGs a lot. I, I have ill will, it's fine. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it. But there is there's more potential to do things that are out of the box and wildly creative. Um, when you are when you're at a table and someone else is running the game and they're a person that you can talk to. Cause if if you talk to the GM and say, hey this isn't in the book the book doesn't say what I'm supposed to be able to do. It doesn't what are your say thoughts I on can't this? do this. Yep. You can, <laughs> That's usually how it goes. You end up being able to kind of collaborate as a group yeah. to take places where the book doesn't quite know what you're supposed to do and turn those into fun and interesting storytelling. Uh, so when you're writing these game systems, how, how heavily are you thinking about people playing their characters as characters and, and less as just a, a, an icon? Um, personally, I don't worry too much about that as a designer. Mm -hmm. I, I think people come to the hobby for usually one of two reasons. Okay. Either to play a character in a story yep. or to play a game and win. Murder and hobo. I don't <laughs> think either one of those is intrinsically bad yeah. as long as everyone's communicating and everyone knows what like people at the table want from the game. Mm -hmm. So when I do my design, I give as much story information as I can and I give a lot of opportunities for the players 
to collaborate with the GM and build parts of the world. Yeah. Um, but I also make sure that the the dice, the numbersy parts of the system, are all very self-contained and are are gameable, I guess. Yeah. Uh, have strategy and counterplay and a meta game and like you could have two people sit down and just play the numbers against each other mm -hmm. and have that feel interesting and fun. Basically, I want both types of players to be able to engage with my games, whether people are like pure numbers, strategy gaming, there's a plot, but that's kind of an accessory. Yeah. Or whether people are like, no, I'm here for the plot. There are numbers, I guess, and that's cool too, but I want to know about the story. Right. I want both types of people to be happy. And is that challenging to kind of set it up in that, that fashion where uh, both those things work? I'm definitely... I'm more of a story person myself. Yeah. So I have a little bit of trouble with the mechanics, but I've found that if I can run something by a playtest group a couple of times and keep getting feedback and keep fine-tuning, yeah. I can usually make the numbers feel fun, too. Uh, so what was the first game that you worked on? Uh, it, or, are, or is are, it a game you're like, no, I don't, no, no, I don't no, even I, want to talk about that are game. Are we talking first first game or first like reasonable commercial project? Or I'd like say commercial first project. First game for myself. I'd say commercial project. Okay. Um, I freelanced on a game called Splinter. Okay. Which is about a kind of a dystopian virtual reality game show. Yeah. Where you are playing as actors who are playing as characters inside of a simulated dungeon. Okay. It's it's a bit trippy. That's, uh, it sounds complicated. Um, you you play as a player in the dystopian world. Yep. And then they plug into a virtual reality simulation mm -hmm. and play a character inside the virtual reality simulation. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, and it's got like, if you die in the game, you die in real life tropes and like. Yeah. It's it's very very pulpy. But that was the first thing I wrote any content for. Uh, I reached out to the creator. He said, I need some monsters for the monster manual supplement. Yeah. And so I designed a bunch of creatures that would fit in sort of a wacky virtual la labyrinth. Hmm. And so now you're working on a project that has a Kickstarter. Yes. Um, how's that been? Do you enjoy Kickstarter? Are you like, it's just, it, it is what it is, and it's part of the, the deal? It's not a love-hate relationship. It's more like a love and stress relationship. Yeah. Um, I enjoy kickstarting immensely. It's a lot of work. Yep. Um, you create your, or I at least, everybody's got a different process. I create my project first, mm -hmm. and then I start to amass the art that'll go onto the page. Yeah. Uh, and then I build the Kickstarter page, and then I proof both the project and the page and make sure they're mostly what I want. Um, and it's only after that point that the campaign goes live. And from there, I write updates for the page. I clarify stuff that I forgot to include when the backers bring it up. Mm -hmm. uh, I drive to local game stores. I guest star on podcasts like this, I suppose. <laughs> uh, and just generally try to promote it for yeah. the total run of the Kickstarter. And then... And, and I'm sure it's been just like critical roles where you made like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in oh. forty five minutes. <laughs> it's not impossible. You can help. Um, um, but we're, so is this the? Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten this. The fishing one, right? Is that the one that's being Kickstarter right yes, now? Yes, okay. Rod Reel and Fist is currently on Kickstarter and will be until October seventh. Okay. I don't know when this podcast. This will is going air. on Monday. Oh, all right. Uh, so they can go there and they can. Uh, what kind of? Um, so for anyone who lives under a rock and doesn't know it, you shouldn't be listening to a podcast and not know what Kickstarter is. So it's a way they can back the project uh, prior to it being physically created. Yes. And usually there's like a starting um, donation. Donation? I don't know if that's the right it's, word. It's a little unclear. Kickstarter yeah. is crowdfunding. And so it's, it's not supposed to be treated like a conventional shop, but honestly, I think it kind of should be. Right. If, if you're backing a project that I'm running, I should have an obligation to deliver the thing that I've promised. Right. Um, but so, and as as your dollar amount goes up, you tend to get extra stuff. Yes. So uh, what kind of extra stuff can people get? There is a kind of gamification to the campaign itself. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so there are stretch goals, which are once, once the project reaches a certain amount of total funding, uh, new elements get added to the game. Um, in, in this case, it would be things like new kinds of fish, yeah. new kinds of animals, new scenarios that you can play through, um, new settings that yeah. you can have a fishing adventure in, and those are somewhat wildly different. Okay. Um, and, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, so now I'm just curious about the overall quest. There's one magic fish, but and we talked about <laughs> side quests. Now, do these side quests go beyond fishing? Is it like how does the fishing mechanic work? Like that, okay. that's how does it fit into the story? Is it combative fishing? Uh, the quick answer to that is yes. The long answer is. I want to quickly add a little bit more context to the game. Mm -hmm. I really like games and just designs where everybody at the table collaborates. Mm -hmm. So it's not just your people who live in this one village trying to catch this one fish. Yeah. The village, the fish, the bad thing that's going to happen, the place where the fish lives, those are all things that you as a group decide before you start playing. Oh, okay. Um, there's a sort of setting creation yep. uh, that you do before you fire up a game session where you'll, you'll look to the player on your left and say, hey, what does this setting look like? Where does it take place? Mm -hmm. Are we on Earth? Are we in space? Is this uh, the future, the past? Um, and then you'll go to the player to the left of them and say, where is the village inside this setting? Oh. What does it so look it's, like? It's almost like uh, collaborative DMing. Yes, for, interesting. for the setup. The very yeah. first thing you do is collaborate and build all these elements. And that means that you have some personal buy-in. Yeah. When you turn to another person at the table and say, hey, what's the bad thing that's going to happen to this village? Yeah. And they say, oh, there's a meteor that's coming. And the interesting thing is your adventure will then be... Highly a, custom. And as interesting as your friend's. Yes. Like, if you, your friends are pretty straight-laced and normal, uh, which most RPG people aren't, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, uh, are we, we're fishing in Plymouth. Uh, the bad thing is taxes. I, that's fine, yeah. too. Uh, even with that setup, I feel like there's some good oh, it narrative could be hooks. very interesting. But if there is a fish somewhere in Plymouth that makes your village immune to taxes, yeah. that's already kind of whimsical and great. <laughs> But then, I mean, the people I generally play with will be like, the bad thing that'll be happen will be like some sort of giant hamster coming to steal all your gummy bears or yeah. something insane. That's perfect, too. Yeah. Um, the idea is to have the game kind of conform to the group before you've even started playing. Uh, ideally, you get a setting that everyone likes right off the bat. Yeah. And if you don't do that, you get a setting where everyone likes at least the part of it that they that designed. That they put into it, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's a really interesting uh, concept. I've never heard of a game that does that. So there's a few others. Yeah. I've, I've seen a few. They're mostly in like the the indie end of yep. of uh, tabletop gaming. Um, but okay, having answered that question, you asked about fishing. Yes. Um, the game does have what is called fish combat. Okay. There, uh, were, there was air quotes around that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is where the dice really come in. Okay. Um, it's. The dice are simple. You're usually rolling just a couple of six-sided dice, mm -hmm. and you're looking to get one of those dice over a four or a five or a six, depending on how hard the thing you're trying to do is. Yep. Um, because I wanted to design this as an all-ages game, and I wanted to make a game that wouldn't frustrate young players, yeah. um, I set it up so that when you roll the dice to see if you succeed at something, and those dice go, don't go your way, and you fail. It's never a terrible consequences happen kind of situation. Mm -hmm. It's always a, this is a temporary setback. Yeah. If, if you just roll badly on the dice, you'll take something that's called stress or exhaustion. Yeah. And what those do is they lower your chance of succeeding on mm -hmm. future rolls. Okay. Um, so the more you fail, the harder it is to succeed, but... You can, you, you, can, still, you can still succeed. You can take a break. You yeah. can do what's called making camp yeah. uh, and just kick back for a minute and rest and lose all of your exhaustion, all of your stress, and your rolls go back to being very easy. Nice. Um, so it's, 
it's never a game where you sort of fail backwards. Mm -hmm. You always kind of fail towards the neutral. Like if, yeah. if things get too tough, if you get too many points of penalties, you just stop and, and rest for a bit yeah. and then keep playing. Uh, so it might be a good way to onboard people or on, on, board, on board younger players to uh, a, a role-playing game. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I did try to design it so that no matter what age you are, you can find something here. Mm -hmm. If if you like darker, more complicated stories, you just have to build a darker, more complicated setting before right. you start playing, and it's. And that's where the role playing comes in. Yeah, you know, any any mechanic can be used in any situation. You know, the the role playing part is where you make it more complicated or more political or more silly. Yes. And, Let's, let's face it, everyone's going to either steal stuff or burn stuff down, because <laughs> that's the fun part. I've found there's less of that in this game. Um, the game itself tends to have a whimsical tone, yeah. unless the players are really determined to pull in a different direction. Yeah. Uh, and so, even if you end up with a setting that's kind of dark, the gameplay itself is typically pretty lighthearted. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you end up with a setting that's really lighthearted, the gameplay itself is silly. Yeah, nice. So, outside of your own game, what is your favorite RPG to play? Oh, goodness. Uh, I'm going to pick something from probably deep in the indie. Okay. Uh, Dogs in the Vineyard. Okay, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, it is a... It's an indie game that I don't believe ever had any expansions or, or follow-ups. Uh, it was sort of perfect and complete as is. Okay. Um, you play as a dog, magical Mormon <laughs> cowboys. Magical Mormon cowboys. Magical Mormon cowboys okay. in the Wild West. Sure. Which was a weird setup. Yeah. Um. But that's not the appeal of the game. The appeal of the game is the way it handles conflicts. Okay. Um. So in a game like Dungeons and Dragons. If you try to do something where it's not totally sure your character would be able to succeed at that thing, mm -hmm. you usually roll a dice. You usually add in some skills um, yep. that the character has to see if they can succeed. Dogs in the Vineyard doesn't do that. Okay. You have a pile of dice that you roll based on stats like heart or spirit, uh -huh. uh, depending on what kind of conflict you're in. So if you're just talking with someone and trying to convince them, you might roll, I think, heart plus spirit. Don't quote me on that. It's okay. been a while since I've played it. Um, and those dice will fall on the table, and you'll pick numbers out of them and make what are basically poker hands. Oh. And you play those poker hands against the other person. Um, oh, that's interesting. And if the poker starts to not go your way, yeah. you can raise the stakes and say, I escalate the situation. I'm going to go from just talking to a fist fight and you roll in some more dice, and you play more poker, and the stakes go up. Huh. Losing a conversation yeah. has very little consequences. The other person might be mad, you might not get what you want, but there's, there's very little danger based on it. Right. Losing a gunfight, on the other hand, if you escalate all the way up to that, has bad consequences for your character. You can get shot, you can get hurt, and the result is that the game always feels like this very intense back and forth conversation yep. between you and one other person. Hmm. It's, it's a multiplayer game. You can have five or more uh, players and one game master, Yeah. but you always feel like you're in a very intense conversation with one person at the table. That's interesting. Uh, the, the one game mechanic that I always uh, thought was fascinating, and the name of the game escapes me, but it was kind of a... Not, not horror like slasher movie. More suspense horror. Okay. And um, is it dread? Maybe. Is That's it played with a Jenga, Jenga? tower? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So the the more complicated it is, the more pieces you have to pull out of the Jenga tower. Yep. I'm like that is brilliant. Yeah. Um, I have seen some really wonderful creative storytelling game mechanics. Yeah. There is a game out there my, called... My son's playing in a game. This isn't necessarily a mechanic, but my son's playing in a game. It's a, a modern sci-fi setting. Um, but anytime they go into an unlit room, the DM shuts the lights off, and they're using the flashlights on their cell phones to read their paper, to roll oh. their dice. Dice falls on the floor. You're hunting around for your dice. It really 
puts you into that situation. Yeah, that's I like that. That's really immersive. Yeah. Um, and I think there are a lot of tricks that you can either build into the game design itself or that you can do as a game master at the table yep. to kind of add some immersion. And there's like, there's a line you have to walk. You don't want to do stuff that makes your players uncomfortable. Right. Um, but like turning off the lights in, in a darkened area um, or using uh, like printed handouts to give the players clues or bits of information. I've done stuff where um, a character was getting text messages. Yeah. So I sent text messages to a player at the table containing the information they were getting. Oh, nice. Um, so there's there's ways to add to the immersion without, like, without going too crazy. Yeah. So where can people go online to find out more? Obviously, they can go to Kickstarter, but, the, you know, give us the Kickstarter address, and is there a website, a Facebook page, all that stuff? Oh, yeah. If, if you search for Rod, Real, and Fist, um, that's and as in an ampersand. Okay. Uh, which I probably wouldn't do twice, because that's made it harder to search for. Oh, but yeah, I didn't think of that, yeah. Rod, comma, real, comma, ampersand, fist. R-E-E-L or R-E-A-L? Uh, <laughs> R-O-D, comma, R-E-E-L. <laughs> so they can search for that on Kickstarter? Yes. Is there um, a Facebook page they can follow to find out about you and your other games? or? Uh, not really. I don't have a business page. I have a personal page. You're welcome to follow that. It's just a little bit weird if you do. <laughs> um, my other game is on Drive Through RPG. Okay. Um, it's called The Dawn Line. D A W N L I N E. Uh, it's also linked off of the Void Spiral Entertainment uh, Studios page. Um, they're an independent game press. They have a lot of really cool games of their own, and they were nice enough to lend me a ton of help with awesome. Donline. Yeah. Uh, well, it's been great talking to you, man. I'm, I'm glad you braved the, the traffic to get here. and uh, I'm glad I got here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it, this was a lot of fun. I, I mean, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, this doesn't feel like, you know, an hour. No, it went it, by It real actually quick. didn't feel like an hour for me. Uh, so, you know. R-E-A-L, quick. <laughs> so uh, it's always enjoyable when, it, you know, I get to nerd out and talk about role-playing games. Uh, so thanks for coming on to the show. Hopefully our listeners will uh, check out your Kickstarter. They'll, they'll back it and uh, be uh, fighting fish or fighting for fish <laughs> real soon. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. No problem.